Where are you from? Brooklyn, New York. Born and raised. Well, mm -hmm. till the age of four. Okay. And at the age of four, you moved from Brooklyn? Yes, sir, to New Jersey. Okay. Were you raised in New Jersey? Mm hmm For the first uh, 18 years of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was it like growing up in New Jersey? New Jersey was cool, man. It was like the, you know, prototypical uh, suburban experience. I was, you know, uh, the, the one, like, uh, non-Caucasian amongst friends, but they never made me feel like uh, anything other than just a, a good friend. It was a good experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at that point in time, when, when you were like, when you just moved from uh, New York to New Jersey, mm -hmm. were you making music as a kid or like what was going on? I started making music. I remember the exact day I started making music. Shout out to my bro, Sandro. The mm -hmm. exact day I remember that we started uh, messing around with some beat programs uh, called Music Magic Music Maker. Yeah. Remember it like yesterday. How old were you? I was 14. Okay, 14. Yeah, and your boy gonna be 34 in about four months. So you've been in the game for a minute? Yeah. Okay. And so at 14, you put out your, you made your first beat mm -hmm. and you, did you put it out, did you release it for the public? <sighs> no, I was making beats just, you know, for the fun of it for like maybe six years. So to like about 20. And then in college, uh, mm -hmm. because at that point I've been doing it for six years, so I was decent at it. Um, I got a little protege. Um, I was like maybe a sophomore in college and he was like a freshman. So he would be there making beats with me. And that was like the first experience where it was like, I don't know. I, I certainly wasn't doing it on a professional level yet, but it, it felt like the first step. It was like from making beats at the house for, for six years, then getting to college and sharing that, that uh, gift and that love with somebody else. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so you were making these beats in college. Yeah. Did that affect any of your college experience? It did. Man, mm -hmm. it's so cool how when you talk to somebody, like the memories just start flowing, like mm -hmm. things you would not normally think about. I remember we were able to open, the guy I was making music with, we were able to open for, what was that group called? Um, mm -hmm. What was that? Oh, fuck. The New Boys. You remember the New Boys? You're a jerk? Yes! I think yeah. they had one hit single. Well, I think maybe they were they like Nick more. Cannon. They had more than that. I think. Okay, okay. They were doing it for I a little while. The, other one, but. the new boys, yeah. So okay. we opened for them. I drove all the way from Fayetteville, North Carolina, to Asheville, because they were opening at the college. Six-hour oh. drive. Mm -hmm. So these are the moments that I remember that are um, very pivotal mm -hmm. in my journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was it like working with the new boys? Man, it was just that one moment where basically we got to open up for them. So I think at most maybe we zapped them up and that was it. Uh -huh. But it, it just felt like in the moment it felt like the biggest thing in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Were there any challenges at the beginning of your music career? Yeah, I mean, there's con constant challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess after you put in your 10,000 hours, which is where you master your craft, mm -hmm. then the beats, the music is decent enough that people start wanting to work with you. But of course, even before that, I mean, you don't have to put 10,000 hours in for people to want to get on your music. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that that would be one challenge, is getting to that, that feeling of mastery of, of making music. Mm -hmm. And then the next challenge would be to, if you want to go that route, monetizing that, mm -hmm. which you don't necessarily have to. Mm -hmm. You could just do it as a, as a fun hobby. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like um, the independent route is the way to go for artists these days? Uh, I've not been... talked about monetizing this song. Was... Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many ways to monetize as an independent artist, for sure. Mm -hmm. But if somebody, w if Capitol Records was to walk through the door and offer me an advance, I would take it because it would give me leverage to do what I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Uh, it is great to be independent, but it's also great to have the backing of a huge corporation behind you. I guess you have to decide what route you want to take, you know, choose your own adventure. Yeah. I, I personally would do my best to be independent as much as possible mm -hmm. and still uh, court major deals. Mm -hmm. How does your family feel about your music career? They're excited, um, mm -hmm. you know, they've always been very supportive. I like the most supportive parents in the world. Mm -hmm. Shout out Ernestine, shout out Matthew. Okay. Man, shout they're out. amazing. Um, they even came around on the edibles, you know, and that's a big step, you know, that took about a year or so. 
But then they saw that it was a legitimate business, that we're paying taxes, that, you know, I'm really, I'm not just out here hustling drugs, I'm, I'm trying to build a, a, a real business, you know? Mm-hmm. And I hope people see that. Mm-hmm. And so can you talk a little bit about the edible business that you own? Yeah, Eastside mm-hmm. Edibles is going on its third year. Um, it started because at the time, my friend, he basically was like selling the edibles without a name, just, you know, hand to hand, as most people do. And then my dad, of all people, is like, why don't you ask him to build you like a, a product that you could push, you know? my music companies lift off music group. Mm -hmm. So he was like, why don't you ask them to make like a a lift off, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And it turned into the lift off brownie, which was at the time a thousand milligram brownie. We still sell it on our website. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a a big seller. But that was the first product of this Mm -hmm. Eastside Edibles company. And then everything just followed that. Mm -hmm. So really shout out to my dad, which is why they really can't be too mad, you know? Like you gave me the idea. <laughs> is your, um, are your parents entrepreneurs as well? Yeah, uh, my dad, he owns um, like a ten, uh, apartment complex in Brooklyn. Okay, he, okay. Yeah, and it's so cool to see him still work that even at 73 years old, he still puts his heart and mm-hmm. soul into it and, mm-hmm. and it really inspires me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my mom, she is an independent distributor for Young Living. Young Living is like essential oils, mm-hmm. make you really healthy. Wow. Okay. So you come from a lineage of sort of go-getters. Yeah. Where I think did, it's that, that, uh, that immigrant spirit, you know? Okay. And where did your parents uh, immigrate from? Oh, shout out Trinidad. Uh, okay. Nicki Minaj's hometown. <laughs> okay. That's what's up. Yeah. And so do you have any like uh, sort of Caribbean influences in your sound because of that or... I would say if you listen to my music distinctly, no. I mean, I occasionally put like a steel steel pan in. Do you know steel pan? Yeah, it started, that was an instrument uh, that was created and originated in Trinidad. So I throw that in once in a while, but no. If you listen to my music, it just sounds like, you know, top 40 contemporary hip hop, pop. Mm. Yeah. What is it like to be an entrepreneur of color in the cannabis business? I will say it is interesting, but not necessarily difficult. I feel like almost as if people are willing to give me a chance. Oh my God, look at this bug, you guys. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I feel like people are willing to give me a chance even more so because I'm a person of color trying to get into this industry. Mm -hmm. I have uh, experienced nothing but love from Mm -hmm. not only Charlotte, but the NOTA community. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that from other um, entrepreneurs too of color okay. that the experience has been sort of easier for them. Mm. Um, yeah, like I told you off camera, I got a homeboy in Cali, and it's just been seamless for him. So. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And so, what would someone have to do in order to get into the cannabis industry mm-hmm. um, in your town? Yeah. So in in North Carolina, we have a business license. Um, we're a registered company. Mm -hmm. But besides that, you really, for Delta 8, which is what we use, Mm -hmm. uh, that's really about it, you know. Um, Because of the farm bill that was passed in 2018, uh, it's pretty much legal, Mm -hmm. yeah. And now, what is Delta 8? Can you explain that for our listeners? Absolutely. So Delta 8 is a milder, less psychoactive version of cannabis that we're all familiar with. And it, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many others, it makes for a better product to make edibles with because you're not going to freak out as much. You're probably more just going to fall asleep. Uh, But no bad trips, really. Okay, so is it CBD or is that different? Yeah, it would be like CBD, Delta 8 regular weed in terms of potency. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what made you decide to make the, like the gummies? Yeah, I guess just um, that was the demand, you know? The brownies started one thing, but then people started asking for all sorts of other products. Okay. Yeah. And so what's your ultimate goal with um, Eastside Edibles? Oh, man. I would love to see Eastside Edibles products next to every, everywhere there's a Coca-Cola, there's an Eastside Edibles product. Mm -hmm. Why not? And so you want it to be a global brand. Why not? Yeah, let's go to the limit, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what would be like the apex of the cannabis entrepreneur? Like for Uh, for a cannabis entrepreneur, what's the biggest thing you can do? Um, Have you been following the story of Burner? 
Yeah, I know Bernie. Man, he's blowing up. I think he's almost worth a billion dollars now mm -hmm. off of cannabis. So I guess mm -hmm. that would be the dream, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I see he has those um, ancillary businesses like Cookies. Okay. Um, isn't it Cookies Clothing? Yes. Yeah, and he made Forbes again. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's dope. Man. And that was just through branding, you know, trademarking uh -huh. the cookies name and brand. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to do the same thing with Eastside Edibles. Mm -hmm. If any clothing brands want to team up with me, man, hit me up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so have there been um, like, what's the most memorable moment with Eastside Edibles for you? Ooh, there's been so many, man. Um, more than anything, just meeting the interesting characters along the way. I've met so many amazing people that are still in my life that some have come and gone, but because of having this business, just met uh, the most wonderful folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you say to people who feel that cannabis is dangerous? Uh, I'd say to each their own. You know, aspirin is dangerous if you take it in the wrong dose. Um, so you gotta be careful of what you ingest. Mm -hmm. And as a cannabis user and cannabis mm -hmm. company owner, I would strongly push CBD, which has no psychoactive effects, and then mm -hmm. you just get the positive effects of cannabis. Mm -hmm. I, even myself could see getting off a of cannabis psychoactive, you know, like Delta 8 or, or THC, mm -hmm. to just have CBD within the next five years. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, um, like once cannabis is federally, federally legal, because you know it's going to be eventually, yeah. Yeah. do you feel like smaller, like mom and pop shops will be able to keep up with... Oh. The larger corporations? Man, you are, you, are, you are speaking my language. This is something that keeps me up every night. I would actually rather it not ever become federally legal, keep it the way it is so we can have this niche because I feel like when it becomes federally legal, little companies like me won't have a chance. So that's why I'm trying to get as big as possible before, before that happens. Yeah. Do you have like a timeline in mind of when you think Oh, uh, I feel like they've been saying three to five years for the past 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> so I really... You're right. I dare say it never happens. <laughs> I say that right here in the spot. It never happens. It will Let's always just it. be. It will always just be uh, percolating through the political system. <laughs> That's my two cents. Yeah, and you know, I felt the same way because I'm like, yo, once they legalize this, it's gonna be show done for your local dealer. Even the people who aren't legal or registered, they're okay. done. It's over. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because people can walk into the store. Mm-hmm. They probably are going to be able to walk into like a Walmart or a Target. Yes. We're just a, a Circle K in Florida, I believe. Google it. Just start selling cannabis. So it is happening. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what is the strategy for uh, like a smaller, smaller cannabis company to fight that? Like, is there anything you can do or... I don't think it's a matter of fighting the legislation. I say let that play out. I think my main goal as the CEO of Eastside Edibles is mm -hmm. to grow this company as fast and as aggressively as possible, mm -hmm. uh, sustainably. Um, and to do so, it, it goes back to grassroots. We have a very strong email list. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's about, uh, I ain't gonna say how, how big it is, but the email yeah, list yeah. is growing daily. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's about meeting people face to face and having mm -hmm. real conversations with people. And that's why I'm so happy to have the, the, the guy that I've just named president of the company, um, mm -hmm. Antonio Murata, who is mm -hmm. doing a wonderful job out in NOTA, uh, meeting these people, shaking hands and, and kissing babies, mm -hmm. as the saying goes, to, to, to build this company from lore to legend. Yeah, yeah. We even give out free hot chocolate. We give out free ice pops. We give out, you know, we, we just want to be part of the community, you know? Mm -hmm. Not just take from the community, but give back. Yeah. Do you feel that Eastside Edibles will be a company that you, like, retain 100% ownership of, or do you eventually want to make an exit? I've thought about that, and it's only three years in. It's, it's mm -hmm. so strange, and it, I wonder about what it says about me that I'm doing something I love. Mm -hmm. more than anything but I also can't see I can't see doing it for the rest of my life oh, it's really? so weird to balance those two thoughts you know mm -hmm. but it is as it is so, but for now I, I love it I enjoy doing it I've taken a different role name, after naming Antonio president right. I've now taken more of a supportive role mm -hmm. to his uh, uh, his direction for the company he mm -hmm. has that position for 12 months and we'll see how it goes but this company has, has, has elevated me from one, from one level to a next, and I'm yeah. trying to do that for other people. 
as much as I can, you know? Mm -hmm. It still is a business that needs to be profitable, so it's not like I'm out here just saving the world, but mm -hmm. when I see something in somebody, I'm gonna try to push them as much as I can. How important is it to select leaders that you can depend on? Oh my God, so important, especially with a small company mm -hmm. um, where every situation could be the life and death of a company, you wow. know? like. Um, I can't think of any specifics, but yeah, leadership and, and trusting y your coworkers and your p business partners is essential. It's everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For someone watching this who aspires to do what you do, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them? Absolutely, just follow your dreams, follow your heart, uh, meditate. I'm not going to sound too preachy on here, but these are the things that work for me. Yeah.